Good morning. Good morning. Well, this is the first Sunday of Advent, and uh, this is the time that we start our Advent readings. And, uh, you know, not everyone is as familiar with Advent, the Advent wreath uh, that we have here displayed today. And uh, the colors of the candles and what that represents. Uh, so just a little bit of explanation. You know, every year we are usually busy preparing uh, for the Christmas season. There's a lot of Christmas parties and Christmas cookies and all of that. Well, this year is a little bit different. Uh, normally, we're uh, really feeling like it. We don't have time to even get ready for these things and everything is happening at once. But the pandemic has put a pause on a lot of things. And uh, many of us have had... Uh, had to cancel plans. Some of the things that we normally do for Christmas, we haven't done. And Advent is about taking a pause and, and really remembering what the purpose of it is. And uh, we've tried to do that through the Christian calendar uh, this year. I guess the pandemic is forcing us to do that somewhat. But the word Advent means coming. And uh, it's about preparing the hearts for not only looking back at the coming of Christ, but what is ahead, the coming of Christ, and looking at uh, the fact that God is with us. So if you have an Advent wreath in your church, and some people do them in their homes, uh, it can be a wonderful reminder that God is with us. The candles on the Advent wreath represent hope, peace, joy, and love. And you know, one of them, uh, the joy candle, uh, you can see uh, there's a pink candle. And uh, the rest are, are usually purple or blue. And then you have the one in the middle, which is the Christ candle that is lit uh, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. And so these are symbols that remind us of the meaning of Advent. Emmanuel, God with us. So in the midst of this Christmas season... May this sacred pause be a time of joy for everyone, even in the midst of a pandemic. And with that, we usually have Advent readings. And today, uh, Johnny and Paul are going to do that for us. Keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come. In the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn. Or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. What I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. The scripture lesson is taken from Mark chapter 13, verses 24 through 37, Christ's return. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars of heaven will fall and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send his angels and gather together his select from the four winds from the farthest part of earth to the farthest part of heaven. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch had already become tender and put forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work 
and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he finds you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. It's tempting to hear Mark's call to keep awake as a warning or threat. What if we heard these words as hopeful, as an invitation to set aside the Christmas list, maybe decline a few parties, and to focus instead on keeping our hearts awake? Look for signs of God's presence this week. Where is God already present? How is Jesus coming to you in this season? God, at the present moment, we hear your invitation to keep awake. When hope flee, feels as fleeting as a bird, remind us that you are ever present. We pray that hope lingers and makes a home in our lives this Advent. Amen. Thank you, Paul and Johnny. Let's sing number 211, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Join me three, number 881, the Apostles' Creed. 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the of all, we just wanted to share this morning, um, you know, we try every year to sort of share with the church and their giving and some of the programs. Um, and so we wanted to just sort of share some of those with you, our church, and just to thank you and let you know what you're giving and how it goes out into not just the community, but the world, sharing the light of Christ and being the hands and feet of Christ. So um, we have several things that we contribute to throughout the year, and uh, uh, many people throughout the year put this as a little note on their check that they want to add that, and you can still do that. On the Disaster Relief Fund, um, we've spent $1,026.98 on that, and that basically goes for um, just different things that we've come up in the community or um, you know, people who've had fires or just different things, and we try to help with that. Our backpack ministry, um, we have uh, brought in $1,500 this year for the backpack ministry. Um, not sure where that's going for forward, but we want to just continue to bless that ministry. Our scholarship fund, we have um, paid out this year $250, and, and we do that every year for those that are graduating from junior high and high school. Our Appalachian Pregnancy Care Fund, we've, we've uh, paid out $400 this year, wonderful program. Um, Have a Heart for Seniors, we've done $275. That's for the um, long-term care center um, that is located up there near well more, thank you. Um, then we have Judy's Place for Kids. We've given $585. It's a wonderful program. Um, and Kentucky Methodist Children's Home. We have expensed, uh, paid $2,375 so far this year. And so that's, and we still have more to give. Um, Helping Hands, we've done $1,200 this year. Um, and of course, our UMCOR projects, uh, Congo relief efforts, Redbird mission, hurricane relief. There's just many, many different projects that we've been helping them as the hands and feet of Christ, $1,270 this year. And then of course, miscellaneous donations. Uh, there's, there's a lot of different programs. Uh, Samaritan's Perth, Methodist Mountain Mission, um, Kentucky Annual Conference Mission, um, different items, $1,900. So that's a lot. And for a little church on this hill, we just continue to be so thankful for the giving and the sharing of love throughout the world and community. All right, so next, uh, the reading or the prayer list? Prayer list. Prayer list, okay. So um, I know today that many of you have prayers out there. Um, that you can't be here to share, and so we want to have you lift your hearts with us in prayer for them. But these are some of those that have been on our hearts and minds over the last few weeks and months, and we want to continue um, in Sydney Parish. 
we want to remember her and Lindsay Emma. Matt White as he continues therapy. Cooper Coleman, he was done with chemo. We we'll want to continue to remember him. Jeff McKinney, just uh, long-term uh, health issues. We want to pray for him. Robert Staggs. Um, let's see, Baby Maverick. Debbie Meek, working on heart transplant testing. Carson Potter, a uh, young child who's had multiple brain surgeries. I want to remember him. Several people who have requested prayer that have COVID, and with our son having that a few months ago, going through so many issues, we definitely want to remember those. Amy Walker Skull, former member here, um, we want to remember her too. And our nation, and uh, the students and teachers as they continue. And Brian Bishop, uh, a friend of ours uh, in the ministry, we want to remember him. Are any others here today? Do we want to remember? Let's remember, continue to remember Gary Taylor and his wife. Yes. 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 At this time, uh, we'll go to the Lord in, in prayer, and we want to certainly recognize that there's people out there that have needs that can't speak up, but God knows your heart. So let's uh, pray. Lord, today we want to thank you, God, for this time and want to pray for everyone here. We want to pray, God, for these requests as we lift them up. And Lord, we realize that there's a lot of needs out there and this pandemic has increased the anxiety, has increased, uh, Lord, the uh, economic disparities to today. And we want to pray, Father, for this vaccine that has been told that it's coming soon that it would be effective and god that people would be willing and we want to pray father for your will to be done uh, in our church with all these prayer requests and now we pray lord as you taught us our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right. Uh, before we sing our doxology, uh, Sandy has already uh, given a pretty good report of some of the things that we've done this year. And uh, just... It's kind of a reminder, uh, you may not be able to tell for some of you, but we are still not having in-person services. So it's just our, a few of our worship team that are here today. Uh, so this is the time that if you'd like to give, if you're uh, able to give, if you have a home church, of course, uh, we want you to give to your church. But uh, these ministries are important and we want to continue those. And right now that we're not having in-person services, it makes it a little harder for people, a little more challenging to, to be able to put in the plate since we can't pass the plate and there's nobody here to pass it to. Uh, so we, uh, we thank you for your giving. We, uh, we know that you can uh, mail those checks in to uh, Salem United Methodist Church, 111 Taylor Hill, Pikeville, Kentucky. Uh, that's uh, 41501. So uh, we thank you for, for your giving. And, and uh, of course, Paul Ford is our finance chairman, and he lives up here. And uh, I don't know, uh, I'm sure he wouldn't mind if you get a hold of him to, uh, if you want to donate as, as well. But uh, so we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. I mean, uh, we're going to sing our doxology, excuse me. Uh, and for those that are here, three or four, let's stand and sing our doxology, and you join us at home.
so Paul would you bless the offering Father we thank you this time to present this offering to you we thank you Lord for all your many blessings to us pray Lord we may use it wisely for your kingdom and so unto you pray the rest of this fortune Lord during this time we thank you Lord for the generosity of your people bless your pray in the name of Jesus Amen Amen, Amen. A little bit ago, uh, there was a strange noise. I thought it was in the sound system. Uh, couldn't figure it out. And it was my hearing aid. Uh, I had put it in my pocket and it was going off. And so, uh, true story. <laughs> um, so, uh, for those of you that, that are watching this live, you, you probably won't see this. You'll have to go on later. But uh, William Burchett, we recorded a uh, rendition of him playing a, a Christmas uh musical on the piano and that will be shared uh, hopefully later today on our facebook uh, salem umc facebook and so you'll have to look for that and it will also be in our recorded service that should be up tomorrow and it's on youtube and it's also on our facebook So I'm sure you'll be blessed with that. And at this time, Sandy's going to come and read our scripture today. And uh, to know we can share a podium because we live together. <laughs> oh, all right. So today's reading is from Isaiah 64, 1 through 9. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence. As when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, nor ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways, but you were angry and we sinned because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, and you are our powder. 
We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, yikes, it's Advent. That is usually about what I say. There's probably a better theological way to say that. But uh, that's kind of what happens every year. It sort of creeps up on us. Uh, I don't know about you, but it's like we know it's coming. We know that it's on its way. And uh, we know that it begins around December, sometimes the last of, of November. But at, at the same time, it always seems like Wow, I mean, it's Advent already, and uh, that means Christmas is right around the corner. Uh, and then we realize that we're not ready, or I feel that way sometimes. I'm not ready for Advent, and, uh, and you know, I think that's why they put it in the Christian calendar. The, the powers that be, the, the uh, wise leaders of the past understood that we need a little bit of a swift kick to get us in gear to remind us every year of this time of preparation and uh, this time of, of Advent. And it's a reminder, too, to all of us that it's a new reality. Sometimes we think that uh, as we think about Christmas and, and we try to put Advent and Christmas in the same basket, and they're really not, because Advent is really an anticipation and a time of preparation. It's not just looking back on a baby that was born. Uh, that's part of it, but that's only part of it. It's, Advent is about looking forward and preparing for His second coming. It's about preparing our hearts even for this time of year. That, you know, it seems like sometimes we, it, it, it's that we're not where we need to be and, and, and things are kind of a mess in our lives. And it's a reminder for us to kind of straighten up the mess. I remember uh, one time not long after coming here to this church, there was a particular family that I was trying to visit and wanted to go to the, to the home to visit. And I'd, I'd made several requests, like, uh, I'd like to come and see you sometime. And they never did really reply. And so one day I, I uh, saw this uh, lady and, and I said, uh, we'd like to uh, come and visit you in your home. And her little boy was there and he was much younger then. And he looked at me and said, you can't come to our house. It's a mess. <laughs> And so, uh, of course, I, I thought about that. You know, the, the, maybe that was the reason that uh, they didn't want, want me to come. And I wonder sometimes if we might say the same thing to God. If God were to just show up today, if, if we were to, be, it were to be announced that He is coming, would we say the same thing? Our life is a mess. We're not ready for your coming. And so it's kind of like when you were younger and you knew that company was coming and you realize you know, your mom is frantic because the house is not what it should be in, in her mind. And, and uh, so all of a sudden she tells you to go clean your room and, and you go in there and, and you throw stuff under the bed and throw stuff in the closet. And, and then she walks in and, and she's upset and you said, what's wrong with it? I cleaned my room, you know. And she says it's still a pigsty, you know, it's still a mess. Um, and that's really what the theme of the uh, uh, next few weeks is going to be, is, is companies coming. Somebody's coming, and we need to prepare for that. And yes, it's a mess. Our lives are a mess. Even for those of us who think we have it all together, and for those of us who pretend we have it all together, the reality of it is, uh, somewhere in our lives is dysfunction, and there's a mess. And we need to, uh, to prepare for that. And that's what Isaiah is really about. Reminding us that company is coming. And the writer opens up by saying, Oh, that the heavens would open up and that you would come down and visit us. And that the mountains would tremble and the earth would shake and the water would boil. And he's wanting a grand entrance for sure. 
<clears throat> and he's remembering a time when God did just those things. Yes, there was a time when God, uh, many times when he did miraculous things and, uh, for Israel. And they're wanting to see that again. And it was a time when they couldn't really see God. They were going through a time of exile, and they felt like God was nowhere around. I, I remember visiting someone in the hospital not long ago, and uh, they were having a hard time, and they're like, I just feel like God has abandoned me. But you know, the truth is, God has not abandoned us. Sometimes it may feel that way. May, we may not sense His presence, but He has not abandoned us at all. Uh, a fellow by the name of Christopher Davis, a, a pastor, uh, talked about a time when he lost his son or was detached from his son for a time being in Toys R Us. Most of us parents have experienced that at least one time. Uh, but he talked about when, when his son was a, Christopher was a boy and he got lost and uh, he said he began to look all around and couldn't find him. He said, I didn't, I knew he hadn't left the store because I could see the, the doors. So I began, I still got kind of panicked a little bit, started looking around the aisles, couldn't find him. Finally, I saw a security guard and I said to that security guard, I've lost my son. Do you have a camera system? He said, yes, we do. He said, can I look at it? And he said, yes. So he takes them and, and they have that surveillance and they start looking on, in every aisle. And finally, he sees his son, Christopher, there in the toy aisle. But he's crying. He is upset and he's scared and a little panicked because he's lost and he doesn't know where his father is. And he says to the man, do you have uh, an intercom system here? And he said, yes, can I use it? And so he picks up the mic and he says to his son, and he looks at him in that toy aisle and says, Christopher, Christopher, this is your father. And I know you can't see me, but I'm coming to you. Stay right where you are. And as I think about that story, I'm reminded that the same thing happens to us sometimes. There's a God that we can't see and a God sometimes that we feel like His presence is far from us. And you're, we're reminded many times by the Scripture of a God who does see and whose presence permeates in our lives and sometimes even interrupts our lives. But in the moments that we think that, we, that God cannot see us, understand that He does. The all-seeing eye of God sees us. So in Isaiah 64, the children of Israel were much like this son in Toys R Us. They felt like they could not see God, and they even really believed that God could not see them, that He was abandoning them or whatever. And so they wanted God, they began to remind God of some things that God had done in the past. But I think that more than God needed to be reminded they needed to be reminded, and they need to remind themselves of God's presence. And sometimes we forget that. We forget how God has been there in the past for us. And so they remind him of the quaking mountains and, and ask him that he might come down and, 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 and do that again. And the, the burning brushwood and boiling water and all those things. And yet, this is... So true that a lot of times God doesn't respond as we think He should and when we think He should. And we're reminded of Mary at the, the feet of Jesus. And Lord, it's been four days. Where have you been? And in verse 4 of this, this text here, we can see the, the, the writer here is reminding us again that good things come for those who wait. For he says, the day of vengeance, excuse me, verse 4, from ages past no one has heard, no ear perceived, no eye has seen any God beside you who works for those who wait for Him. Notice that there is a uh, kind of a, a necessary component for something great to happen with God, and that is those that wait on the Lord. Over and over and over again in the Hebrew Bible, we are reminded to wait on the Lord. That's been a theme the last few weeks. 
Psalm 27, 14, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and He shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Psalm 37, 9, For evil doers shall be cut off, but those who wait upon the Lord shall inherit the earth. And then Psalm 40, verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord, and He inclined unto me and heard my cry. And so waiting is, is a part of the Bible, and it's not something that a lot of us like to do. These days with the pandemic and restaurants having no indoor dining, we're required to wait a lot, of, a lot longer than we used to in the drive throughs And sometimes the drive throughs are backed up for a long ways. But we know that waiting is part of life. And I want to say a few things about that. First of all, the Lord is worth waiting for. Amen? The Lord is worth waiting for. Most of us don't mind waiting if it's something that we really want to wait for. Now for me, it, everybody's different. I had a cousin who stood back when uh, Turtle Man, y'all remember Turtle Man? Back when he was real popular. I had a, a young cousin who stood in the rain in the line for hours, how many hours, uh, just to see Turtle Man. Well, I was there and I took my kids and after about, I don't know, 35 or maybe the first hour I was out of there. My grandkids wanted to see him. I said, it ain't worth it. That was not worth the wait for me to see Turtle Man. But it was for some people. The other day I was driving down the road in a church in town and they give away free food boxes every month at this particular church. And I noticed cars all the way around the building in a, in a line in a zigzag pattern all the way down the highway almost as far as you could see was a line of cars waiting to get those food boxes that they give out once a month. And I realize that there's probably some of the people in that group that, that aren't as needy as maybe they should be or, or you know, claim to be. But I was, first thing I thought to myself, I don't think I would wait that long to get a box of food. And then of course immediately I, re, I was reminded, you would if you were hungry enough. And you know, Jesus said in the Bible, if you hunger and th those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, blessed are they, because they shall be filled. And so if we're waiting and we're uh, hungering and thirsting for the things of God, God has promised that He will take care of us. So the Lord is worth waiting for. He's worth waiting for. Number two, God reserves the right to keep us waiting. He's God. And he has that right. He kind of knows what he's doing. He has a knack for that. And, uh, you know, time was not made for humans. Time was made for God. Uh, I mean, time was made for humans, not for God. God has no need of time. Time to God is, is not really a big deal. You know, the Bible says a thousand years is, is like one day with the Lord. God is never in a hurry. And sometimes when we think He's waiting a whole long time, and you know Israel waited for 400 years for deliverance, and, and for us, that is almost like an eternity. But to God, it's really not. I re read the story you may have heard about little Johnny who was out in the field one day, laying in the tall grass, looking up at the clouds and the puffy clouds, and he began to think about God. And he thought to himself, uh, what is God like? And so he just out loud said, God, what are you like? And, hey, God. And God said, yes, Johnny. What do you want? Johnny was astonished and he said, what, what is a, a, a million years like to you? And God said, well, it's trying to make him in his language. Johnny, it's like a minute. Oh, okay. Well, what's a million dollars like to you? And God said, it's, well, it's like a penny. And Johnny said, God, can I have a million dollars? And God said, yes, in a minute. <laughs> so, you know, with God, time is not a big deal. It doesn't make that much difference. And we have to understand that our timetable is not the same as God's. Because God has all eternity. 
And when we think that He's delaying His coming or whatever, uh, we're mistaken. Because God has proven time and time again. You know, the Scriptures predicted the coming of the first Messiah, the, the Messiah the first time for thousands of years. And I'm sure people got tired of hearing it. People said that's old news. And people thought, well, it's never happened. I, I've heard about this all of my life. But eventually it did happen, just exactly as the Bible said it would. And I believe that His return is the same way. So God reserves a right to keep us waiting. But number three, I want to point this out. God's purpose has never been our destruction. Listen to what I'm saying. God's purpose has never been our destruction. Now, we may bring destruction upon ourselves. We may bring calamity upon ourselves. But God's purpose has never been our destruction. In verse 5 of this passage it says, You meet those who gladly do right, but those who remember uh, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry, and we sinned. We have to understand that a lot of things that happen to us in our lives are things that we bring upon ourselves. I don't know how many times I've seen people who, uh, who have lived a life that have been really a hard life, and then they, something bad happens, and they wonder, why does God let this happen to me? And I want to say, but I don't, God didn't do this. We, we, did it to our, we do it to ourselves. And, uh, you know, we often read in the Old Testament about, uh, you know, God and His anger and, and, think, and we think that's the picture we have. But the reality is today, that may have been true then, but that's not true now because we are standing on the other side of the cross. Jesus was the propitiation for our sins. He took care of the sin problem. And so God's not just going to wipe us off the map uh, because we do something wrong. We have an antidote for our sin. We have a, a, a cure. And it's called the blood of Jesus. God's purpose has never been to destroy us. But yet we constantly destroy the things that God gives us. Hence, I was thinking about, uh, John asked me about my dog story. This is where the dog story comes in, John. Most, some of you have already seen our Facebook post and you've heard the story about our dogs. And we, uh, for the first, first time, I've always wanted to smoke a turkey, never, never did, because it takes hours to do it. So we did get a small, uh, you know, a turkey breast, and I smoked it for several hours. Couldn't wait to eat this turkey, you know. And uh, I, uh, Sandy was decided to take me to work, and I, I, we, she set the turkey, which was frozen and wrapped in Reynolds wrap, up on the counter. And it was only going to be five minutes. And when we got back, or she got back to the house, they had the turkey, and they were going to town with the Christmas turkey. Um, and you know, we've we've. <laughs> <laughs> we're reminded of the Christmas story, the, sh the movie, the a Christmas story. And, and it was just like that. And, and, you know, it was demolished. And I was very, very upset about that. And, you know, the, the truth is we do the same thing to God. God goes out of His way to prepare things for us and, and to give us a wonderful life. And we are the ones who destroy it. And we are the ones who turn around and uh, bring destruction upon ourselves. It was Jesus who said He gave His only begotten Son on a cross that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And God may be disappointed with our behavior. God might have even allowed us in self-destructive behavior. Sometimes He does that. He doesn't force us to do anything. We have a free will to do whatever we want to do. But His purpose is to have a relationship with us, and it's not to destroy us. He's not one of those, uh, you know, as we think about uh, an, an angry God who's up there just wanting to take us out. That is not the picture of God that I see, but a God who gave His Son 
upon the cross of Calvary for each and every one of us. And so today, as we think about this, this truth here that, that, that's been read and talked about, we're reminded that God loves us. And we talk about Israel who, who said they, their righteousness was as filthy rags. And it's all the same for us. And all the things that God has done for us. And the writer reminds us that God is the potter. And we are the clay. I just want to say today that God sees you and He knows everything that we go through. He has not abandoned us. And this pandemic doesn't change God's plans. God knew about it before it happened. It hasn't destroyed God's plans. Many of the things that happen, you know, can be our fault and sometimes they're not. But it hasn't stopped God's plan. God is still on the throne today. And when this is all over and we enter in the spring of, of 2021, many of us will look back and we'll think about what we went through. And I hope that this has been a, a time and a year that doesn't draw us away from God, but brings us closer to Him. Because this is a time where we need God more than ever. We always need Him. But may we be reminded of this, this Advent season of our need for God. And so with that, I'm going to ask the musicians to come as we begin to sing uh, I want to uh, just invite you, as we hear these words, to know that Jesus is coming back. But you can come to Him today. And if you just pray the simple prayer, Lord Jesus, Son of God, be merciful and to be a sinner. He can come into your life and your home today. Let us sing, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, number 196. face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Let us sing sent forth by God's blessing. Thank you. 
this dwelling take leave. The service is ended, oh now be extended, the fruits of our worship in all who believe. The seed of the teaching, receptive souls reaching, shall blossom in action for God and for all. God's grace did invite us, and love shall unite us to work for God's kingdom and answer the